culture of WPP, which is the what we call the parent company or the holding company, it's about uh, now about 350 people, is very different to the culture of a JWC, which is 150 years old, or an Ogilvy. The, the difficulty of running a legacy company is that you have to change the engines whilst the plane is, is flying. Let me tell you two stories from my first couple of months at Google, which was now four and a half, five years ago. Uh, first was I showed up and I said um, to my boss, oh, so where's the plan? And he laughed. And uh, I thought maybe I'd made a bit of a mistake. And uh, then he sent me uh, uh, an email with two links to videos of Eric Schmidt uh, talking. So I watched the videos. And what I saw was Eric laying out very transparently what we were trying to do that quarter and talking about uh, the board meeting discussions that they'd have with great transparency, transparency and honesty and a huge um, degree of trust on all of us not to share uh, some of that externally. I, and I was impressed and immediately started to un understand the culture. And um, in an organization that's grown very fast, one of the most important things for us is to communicate. So a lot of my job internally is communicating as clearly as possible what's going on, thinking about how we simplify the agenda for our Googlers, and uh, listening to what people are saying. So I think that, that um, says something about sort of the role of leadership. And then in terms of culture, I think I would talk about talent. I mean, for us, that's really, really important. I think the same in all, all our organizations. And um, I was in a meeting early on. I'd been to London Business School, so I was tooled up for this meeting uh, with all the jargon. And at some point, I used the fantastic phrase, well, look, it's not just rocket science. So let's get on and do whatever. Uh, and there was a chap in the back of the meeting who was on his laptop the whole time, not really paying a lot of attention. But I wasn't sure what the culture was at this point, so I wasn't sure you know, quite how to deal with that. And afterwards, I asked somebody else you know, about this guy. And they said, uh, actually, he is a rocket scientist. <laughs> uh, and I got to know this chap later on. And um, he had worked for NASA prior to Google. And I said, why would you move from you know, working for NASA to working for Google? And he said, well, because actually, in, in my particular type of computer science, there are uh, five textbooks. And three of them were written by people at Google. And that's why I joined. So I think that also says something about sort of the, the kind of talent and the approach to talent. You know, I'm elected and therefore you get an alignment of interest because you go through that process, you talk to the stakeholders, the partners, and they'll elect someone who they believe reflects the values of the direction the firm is going. And you do get alignment because in the end you get um, you know, close to uh, unanimous support the process we go through. So I was elected with something like 97% support of the partners which uh, Mr. Putin may be able to compete with. <laughs> but um, you know, in a partnership, th there is an absolute focus on stewardship. There's an absolute belief that as partners, you know, we leave the firm in a better place than we found it. Uh, we don't take anything out of the firm we didn't put in. Uh, we don't create capital. We don't take capital away. Uh, and therefore, you are looking not just for the tenure that we have as partners, but for the future. And I think that does create a special focus on you know, building for the long term. So we've learned from IBM, and it's June 16th of this year, we start our second century as a corporation, is that you have to be able to retain the essence of the organization while you do some pretty major transformations. IBM started off uh, in business making punch card tabulators and cheese slicers, um, and has you know, gone through a whole bunch of things, uh, inventing the magnetic stripe on the back of the credit card, inventing the online reservation system uh, for airlines. Uh, written here in the UK, the, uh, the software that runs all of the ATMs today. And being able to do all of that while retaining the essence of the organization is really important. If you look at the world today, all of the systems that make the world operate, whether they're man-made, such as transportation systems, energy systems, whether they're nature-made, such as weather systems or water systems, they're all infused with huge numbers, thousands and thousands, billions, of digital devices, digital devices. Now the transistor that drives those digital devices is more numerous on the planet today than grains of rice are. Grains of rice. Forget about humans interacting across the internet. There are literally trillions of devices that can now interact with each other across the internet. And those devices are, if you can, if you can do something useful with that interaction, you can see your business in a different way. And you can see different types of business opportunities, whether they be adjacent opportunities or whether they be opportunities to collaborate with others. We collide with Google. You know, we are the biggest buyer of search in the world. That's why we use the, the word frenemy. We bang heads with them. So we buy from them, 
we buy a billion dollars of search, so their revenue is the 30 billion. We buy a billion from them in terms of search. Forget about display advertising. That's on top, and that's where they're trying to make further inroads. Okay, so that's one relationship. On the other hand, that guy who who's running the Ford account in the UK probably is worried that Matt and his colleagues are going to try and disintermediate them. That's the most difficult thing, actually, to manage. And um, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about Google, I think, is what I alluded to before. The pressures of building on them, they have a market cap now of 170 billion. I think Apple is now up over 300 billion. IBM is over 200 billion. Poor old WPP is just 16 billion. I hope that Google over time will get scalarotic. Yeah. I mean, I always enjoy talking to, to Mark, and he, he tends to talk more about Google than I do, so it's good to know. <laughs> uh, uh, look, I think um, in the media world, what's going on is a, uh, a significant structural shift, obviously, because people are spending more time online, and we're all trying to figure out what that means for our businesses. And I think uh, what Mark has done in his strategy uh, is setting out uh, digital as being one of the core pillars of the business of the future is right, and they're going through a transformation. But I think um, the point that you make about uh, the nature of business relationships is a good one, and it's much broader than just you know Google and an advertising agency. It's actually about in a more complicated world where technology is more important, the kinds of relationships we're going to have are going to be more multifaceted, and we just better get used to that. And it might be uncomfortable for the guy who's been on the Ford account for 15 years and mainly bought TV advertising to adjust to it, and it might be difficult for the bright young thing at Google who hasn't figured out how to behave yet, but actually, these are going to be the way that relationships work in the future. How does uh, your organizational structure and process foster innovation in your companies? We are a legacy business, uh, and therefore we take the legacy brands, and we, if I, if I take the, the, the mantra of new, new markets, new media, and consumer insight, we encourage those legacy companies to develop their activities in those areas. So three things. Legacy brands move in the new directions. Brands that you have that are halfway there or three quarters of the way there move faster. And then thirdly, set up investments, acquisitions in these new areas, geographical or functional. So if, you, if you're in the newspaper business, it's no use trying to get your existing organization on its own to develop a digital capability. You have to set up digital operations on the own. We tend to measure two things. We tend to measure the input, so the amount of time and energy that's going into, into innovation projects, innovation codes, we can see what's being done. We measure failure rate. I think Matt made the point earlier, I think it's important to have failures in innovation. If you're not, if you're not failing and failing quickly in innovative ideas, then you're probably not coming up with enough ideas. We measure innovation. And then when we have something which is ready to sort of go to market or be taken, we do then measure in more traditional ways the success in terms of the you know, revenue stream coming off that idea. And, and you know, in our sort of organization, those, those innovative ideas will sometimes be in our business and sometimes be for clients. But we measure in those three areas. I think the answer from our point of view is you have to have a messy organization. Messy is good. Messy is good, yeah. It, um, you know, having it neat and tidy like it was in the general motors of the the previous millennium doesn't work. So it's not, 21st century is not for tidy minds.